Well, I think you have a little more European influence, you know, really. Yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so we, are, we are live. Right, okay. Good. All right. Okay. So, uh, well, good morning and good morning for us. Good, good evening for, for our special guest in Japan, Dr. James D'Angelo. A little more yeah, European I think you have a little more European influence. influence. Yes, and and uh, I... Uh, this is this is our meeting uh, with special guests. The the, the meeting of our uh, Ilf Brasil Ufba. So it's a, a, a pleasure, a very very uh, uh, special moment with a colleague that I admire very much, a colleague and friend uh, directly from Nagoya, Japan. So uh, Jim, thank you very much for accepting this invitation, and. Uh, as, as I told you, this is a very informal uh, meeting where, uh, you know, we, 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 this, we invite uh, a special guest and then uh, you can talk about the text that you have asked us to read. And then we take questions, uh, comments uh, from the audience. So, yeah. but before we go, let me, let me talk a little bit about uh, uh, Dr. James D'Angelo. So, uh, uh, well, I, I'll call him Jim. So Jim was born in New Haven, Connecticut, USA, but he's been living in Japan since the 1990s, right, uh, uh, Jim? Yeah, 94. Yeah, and uh, so James has a, a PhD in English from the School of Languages from Northwest University, uh, South Africa, and uh, his doctoral, doctoral thesis uh, was, uh, the title was a broader concept of world English is for education context, applying the world English enterprise to Japanese higher education. So Jim, this is a very interesting topic. And if you want to, you know, talk a little bit about this would be great. Mm -hmm. So um, at this moment, uh, also uh, James has an MA in bilingual ESL from uh, University of Massachusetts, USA. And at this moment, he's a full professor at uh, Chukyu. I don't know if this is the right pronunciation. No, that's good. That's good. University in Nagoya, Japan. So um, his research interests lies in implementing world Englishes and related concepts in higher education curriculum. He is also the editor-in-chief uh, of Routledge, uh, Routledge's uh, Asian Englishes and has published extensively in, world, in, in, in journals like uh, World Englishes, uh, sorry, uh, published in World Englishes, uh, The Status of English as a Lingua Franca, Implications for the Teaching of English in Japan, uh, in, in several other, other uh, journals. And uh, Jim has also published a wide uh, range of book chapters. And for example, I can cite a couple of them here. So uh, he, I think it's out already, this, the, the Bloomsbury World English's uh, mm -hmm. uh, collection in, I, Thelma and I, for example, also have a chapter in this, this collection. Oh, good. It's a critical view of globalization within the expanded role of EMI in Japan, anemic uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. So uh, probably is out and was uh, edited by Mario Saraceni and uh, Yasemin Bayert. And also uh, Jim has a chapter in the Routledge Handbook of English as a Lingua Franca uh, that was uh, out in 2018. So the status of elf in Japan, which is, uh, you know, similar to the text that he, mm -hmm. you know, we are going to explore in a minute. And this, this uh, uh, handbook was edited by uh, Jennifer Jenkins, William uh, Baker and Martin Dewey. And finally, we have the, the, you know, the article we are going to be discussing today, which is the status of English as a lingua franca and implications for teaching for the teaching of English in Japan. So uh, that was published in, in the journal Status Pastonis, uh, which is a, uh, a journal published in Italy and was edited by our 
uh, dear friend and colleague Enrico Grazzi and I also had the pleasure of uh, publishing in the same volume together with my colleague from USP, Ana Paula Dubocchi. So, Jim, again, welcome to our meeting and thank you very much. I know it's a little late for you in Japan, but it's good to know you're, you're with us. And uh, the idea here is to have a, you know, an overview of mm -hmm. elf research and elf developments in Japan. Mm -hmm. So the floor is yours. And again, thank you very much for being with us. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Savio. Um, as Henry Widowson, the elf scholar, well, the scholar of so many things, as Henry Widowson, who's the husband of Barbara Seidelhofer said, Oh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Much of it, <laughs> much of it fictitious, <laughs> and he, no one is funnier than Henry Widowson, who's about yeah, seven yeah. Mm -hmm. so, but um, it's interesting too. My article is the status of English, and the journal is called Status Quaestionis with the Latin name. Uh huh. Um, uh huh. So let me, um, by the way, you referred to my <laughs> PhD dissertation with uh, Bertus Van Rooy, uh, who was past president of the International Association of World Englishes and his the wife, Suzanne uh, Kutsi Van Rooy. And um, yeah, see, at that time, what we call the pluralistic paradigms of World Englishes, Kingsley Bolton had proposed, you know, you have English as an international language, World Englishes. English as a lingua franca, and this is before global Englishes, which is now quite popular, had emerged. And mm -hmm. so Kingsley was looking for an umbrella term, and he came up with the term the World Englishes Enterprise, mm -hmm. as, mm -hmm. and, and putting EIL, World Englishes, and ELF under that. And mm -hmm. um, it didn't catch on <laughs> as well as glo basically global Englishes is attempting to the, do the same thing. And Jennifer Jenkins with her um, center for um, Global Englishes at Southampton uh, mm -hmm, strongly mm -hmm. pushes that. And uh, Nicola Galloway uh, did her PhD with uh, Jennifer, with Jenny Jenkins. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, that I was working towards the same type of thing uh, of an umbrella type term because yeah, I think these various, and that's what this article that we're going to discuss today basically looks at is it's basically ELF but it's looking at these things from, um, you know, those kind of angles. Let me, maybe I share the screen just briefly. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. if I, can do that. I don't, I didn't prepare a PowerPoint uh, because oh, no I knew problem. this was mainly, no, it's okay. mm -hmm. mainly a uh, discussion type thing, but I'll just show you our, um, um, what, what is that in the back? That, let me just, uh, um, this was our college of work. Can you see that? Um, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, in two, in 2002, we founded the College of World Englishes. So I would always use this as kind of my first slide um, when doing presentations, um, you know, because it, we did feel it's an important thing to be the College of World Englishes. Um, but then, you see, we started this in 2002, and ELF had not really quite emerged. It, it was starting to emerge. Now, most of the listeners in your group are quite familiar with ELF, right? Because you've been having a series yeah. of ELF. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so with the chapter, what I do is um, I'm looking at the, the value of ELF for the Japanese context. And Jennifer had asked me to write about the status of ELF. So she didn't mm -hmm. ask me to write about features of elf used by Japanese, you know, so I didn't, you know, it's not an article mainly focused on elf usage by Japanese people with specific, you know, conversation analysis examples, but more about <laughs> what is the standing of elf and these other, what, what we call the pluralistic paradigms of English, starting with English as an international language. And mm -hmm. people, maybe some of your group is still confused because when you go to an elf conference, uh, you would get the mothers of elf at the stage. I remember in, I think it's in Hong Kong, we had uh, Jennifer, Barbara Seidelhofer and Anna Moran and in a Q&A and there was a question and answer box during the conference. And at the end, they picked out questions from the box. And a lot of people said, what's the difference between EIL and elf? And, you know, Jenkins said, well, basically they're the same thing 
for me, you know, whereas uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar. I know Savio is familiar with Farzad Sharifian uh, from mm -hmm. Monash University in Melbourne. And he was very strongly an EIL um, mm -hmm. scholar. And he took a bit of offense as ELF started to emerge because, see, when I wrote my PhD thesis, I call them, um, I call the paradigms, um, not, my advisor wanted me to call it competing paradigms, but I didn't feel they're really competing because mm -hmm. um, actually, as Mario Saracini said to me, we're all talking about the same thing, really. And it's this tolerance uh, realization that English is no longer owned by the native speakers. It's used by people all over the world. And um, you know what I mean? So whether it's EIL or ELF or World English is basically it's, a, it's all of those are a much different way of looking at things than a native centric um, view of the world. Um, so in my article, I give a bit of uh, background about that. Um, I'm not used to sort of talking from a paper. I, PowerPoint <laughs> is much easier. But, uh -huh. uh, um, and you know, it's also good to give credit to Larry Smith because sure. Elf, Elf would not appear if it were not for Larry Smith and Braj Kakshru. You know, so Larry, with all of his work on EIL, yeah, and he, they weren't sure what to call it in the beginning. They called it English as an international auxiliary language. They mm -hmm. talked called it English as an international and intranational language. And finally, they just settled on the um, EIL. And then um, there was a journal called like World Language English or something like that. And mm -hmm. they invited Braj Katru to be editor in chief. And he and Larry actually changed the name to World Englishes around 1985. And then Larry did less work on EIL. Um, mm -hmm. and, but one important person I mentioned on page uh, 358, the second page of my article is Sandra McKay, along yeah. with Larry Smith. And Sandra McKay is someone who continued to do work on EIL uh, while Larry did less on EIL. So she sort of carried the EIL torch um, while most people were working in the world Englishes area. Um, yeah, she even, sorry, she even published uh, Teaching English as an International Language, remember, in 2002. Yeah, I think Cambridge, it sort of has a lavender cover and a very, very important book around 2000. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you have my article, you know, these, uh, all the references, I think, are useful for this. So yes. anyway, in part, in part one of the article, I talk about, um, by the way, the numbers I just noticed in the introduction don't match I talk about part one, part two, part. And these are the numbers are from the uh, Rutledge Handbook of Elf, and then I uh -huh. made me change uh, the numbering sequence, but they didn't get changed in the introduction. Uh -huh. uh, so anyway, let, let's so let's look. Let me just see if there's something I wanted to mention. Um, and, and of course, see Japan is in the expanding circle. That's why it's very important. I mentioned this on page uh, three sixty that. Again, you, you should be familiar with world Englishes. See, the problem today is a lot of people jump right into ELF because they're younger. And for example, Gabriel Fang Fang, who, who you say is coming in a future mm -hmm. thing, he's an excellent scholar and he did his PhD at Southampton. But at Southampton, they don't focus that much on Larry Smith or Braj Katru and the things they did. So mm -hmm. they go right into ELF. Which, and that's why... But you see, World English is, uh, includes, at least it has the expanding circle, the countries that were not colonized, uh, whereas the outer circle, the Singapore's, the Nigeria's, the India's, the Philippines, uh -huh. where, where English uh, has some kind of official status and is used in many domains of society, it, it's natural that they uh, have their indigenized variety of English. But mm -hmm. in a place like Japan, you couldn't really say that a Japanese English exists. Uh, Braj Katru said that Japanese English was a performance variety. In other words, um, you used it in certain situations, you were called upon to use it and it didn't have a written tradition. It's not used in literature or in the minutes of the parliament and things like that. It's, it's a, called a performance, mainly an oral oriented mm -hmm. variety. But see, 
the, the key to understanding about the expanding circle is we don't need English internally that much. And Brazil may be the same way that yeah. you know, mm -hmm. you know, Portuguese, and I don't know how multilingual Brazil is, but Brazil in, in some ways similar to Japan that it's expanding circle. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, whereas you go to Singapore, you go to India, English is the link language. It's, mm -hmm. it's somewhat neutral. I mean, it belonged to the colonial masters, but in terms of the people living in India, English is kind of neutral because if you chose Hindi as the common language, the people in the South would get very angry. And in mm -hmm. Singapore, if you chose, um, if you chose Bahasa, Malaya, or if you chose, you know, Mandarin as the official language, other groups would get angry. So English kind of levels the playing field in the outer circle. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. but in a country like Japan, uh, we don't need English that much internally. Of course, you know, there are foreign companies based here and things like that where you need certain staff that can deal with English, but you don't need it among the Japanese. And there was a fellow named Martin Shell who wrote a thing in World English is about co-linguals. And he said, Singapore, you have co-linguals of English with different first language backgrounds. So you'll see a Malay and an Indian and a Chinese and a cafe in Singapore and they're speaking English. Um, or you'll see two Chinese Singaporeans in a cafe speaking English. Okay, mm -hmm, so whereas mm -hmm. in Japan, if, if all the people are Japanese, it's very rare that you'll find them speaking English. But as, as soon right. as you introduce a, a native speaker or some other uh, nationality into the mix, uh, you, they'll use English. So in other words, Japanese do not use English as co-linguals. So what happens with ELF and the reason you see, these are the people you're inviting. You have a guy from China, you have the people from Greece, you have people from Spain, you have Yasmin from Istanbul, you have me from Japan. <laughs> we're mm -hmm. all expanding circle. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and these people were all interested in world Englishes. That's the, you know, I've known Yasmin from years ago before there was an ELF conference. Mm -hmm. um, you know what I mean? And, and uh, so I knew Enrique uh, from Spain going to the, and, you know, people like Paula. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, um, but, but then as soon as Elf emerged really strongly with the work of uh, Jenkins and Seidelhofer, suddenly the Japanese world English scholars, the Turkish mm -hmm. world English scholars immediately start going to the Elf conference because they understand we need English for international purposes, not intra national purposes and mm -hmm. you don't find the nigerians if you go to an elf conference you will rarely find a nigerian or a singaporean or an indian because for them elf is not so much of an issue you know mm -hmm. and, and they actually doubted that's why my advisor wanted to call them competing paradigms um the the world english's journal wrote some very negative things about elf there was a thing by robert phillips and called um, English as a lingua Frankensteinia. Frankensteinia, yeah. <laughs> the monster, you know, and, and yeah. see, Jennifer Jenkins came up with something in her phonology of English as an international language. She didn't use elf in the 2000 book with the green uh -huh. cover. But inside she talked about the lingua franca core. Sure, sure, yeah. And the certain mm -hmm. phonemes uh, such as, the, you know, the, um, the, dental fricative you know the th uh did not interfere with intelligibility if you say mm -hmm. this is my sister that is a nice car uh, it doesn't in, in interfere with intelligibility but other phonemes do cause problems so she proposed a lingua franca core mm -hmm. for education you know have your students work on these important phonemes but don't have them worry about the th and um a lot of world english's scholars over applied that and they said oh she's proposing lingua franca english yeah not that's right not which is a mistake you know? right yeah mm -hmm. because again the key thing is it's a function any mm -hmm. all these things english as a native language english as a second language elf is english as as a lingua franca so it's a functional thing it's not a variety mm -hmm. so you, it's a mistake to put it in the position of an adjective and say lingua franca english to re reverse elf to lfe because then it becomes the lingua franca becomes like indian english brazilian english okay so but when she said lingua franca core people thought she's proposing 
an actual variety that eventually lingua franca English will emerge as this global common language. And, you know, the thing is, that's why world English is important because when we meet in an elf situation, you know, I'm speaking Japanese American English, you're speaking educated Brazilian English, and we're still using our world English variety in an mm -hmm. elf situation, but it's a function. It's We're not speaking air traffic controller. You know, that's one of the few varieties that where they try to all over the world develop a standard, one standard English uh, other than American <laughs> English, but you know, there's a set set phrases and things like this. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So anyway, um, by the way, uh, at the bottom of page 360, I mentioned this fellow, Takao Suzuki, who was a great, he's the first world Englishes guy in Japan. So it's, uh, it's interesting to look at his work, his work sometime, Takao Suzuki, as late, as early as 1973. He was one of the first scholars. So if you're looking for a the first Japanese scholar on world English type things. It's uh, Takao Suzuki. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then later people like Yano start to emerge. Um, and then what I say on page 361 is you have uh, my former boss, Sanzo Sakai, uh, of course, Nobuyuki Hona, one of the big names. If you go on to Amazon, you can find a lot of books by Nobuyuki Hona. Um, Nobuyuki Hino, it's confusing because you have Nobuyuki Hona and Nobuyuki Hino. Uh, and then you have younger ones like Aya Matsuda, Paul Matsuda. Um, one thing I mentioned too is that Larry Smith was at the East West Center in Hawaii and he saw all those people from 20 Asian countries. So I don't know if in Brazil you're aware of it, but uh, Larry was head English teacher. He's, he wasn't a PhD. He always said, call me Mr. Don't call me Professor Smith. And mm -hmm. he's at this beautiful East-West Center designed by I.M. Pei, the, the famous architect. And um, he's got people from 20 Asian countries and they understood each other perfectly with some negotiation. And so Larry saw what Jenkins saw later. So Larry creates EIL because of what he sees at the East-West Center. And see, after 9-11, I mentioned this in the paper, after September 11th, it became much more difficult for people to get visas in America or international students. And so a lot of them went to the UK instead of because Bush was making it hard to come to mm -hmm. the US. And so Jenkins mm -hmm. saw these people from all these different countries, not mm -hmm. only Asia, but Europe. And, um, she, and so she tried to come up with a name of it, English as a lingua franca. And, and mm -hmm. Alan Firth, you know, you have to credit Alan Firth and Christiane Meyercord to important scholars in our field, they first used the term as early as 96 uh, before Jenkins adopted the term. So it's, you know, they didn't push it. You know, Alan Firth said to me once, you know, you got to really respect what Jenkins and Seidelhofer did because even though Alan Firth may have been the first, um, you know, he didn't popularize the term of elf. You know, he said they were so productive in the first 10 years of 2000, you know. Um, mm -hmm. but, but Larry, you see, and a lot of those scholars went to a lot of the Japanese scholars because Hawaii is so popular with Japanese. They went to East West Center, studied with Larry. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one student once said the Japanese student said to Larry, I, oh, Mr. Smith, I want to study with you because I want to study international English. And yeah, see, this yeah. this student was making the same mistake as making it a variety like lingua franca English. And Larry said, well, you know, I'm happy to have you here, but I'm sorry, I cannot teach you international English. And the Japanese no. student, went, what? You know, so be careful of this term, international English. You'll see it yeah, a lot, it but it, uh -huh. it, it, it's presenting it as a variety, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Um, and I believe, Jim, just to make like yeah. a comment, you know that I took my, my postdoctoral studies in, in Hawaii. And I, my oh. office was right across from, uh, you know, uh, the East West Center. Wow. And, oh. and, uh, and, and that's, that's one of the reasons, for example, Sander McKay went to Hawaii, oh. uh, especially because of, of this whole uh, discussion on, on English as an international language. Oh, really? So, so she was influenced by going there. 
Yeah, well, she okay. actually she li she lived in Hawaii for some years, I'm sure. Oh, okay. See, this yeah. is the advantage of conferences and doing this on Zoom. You know, we fill in gaps that we weren't aware of. You know? Uh huh. Yeah, so that that's very interesting. And actually, Alan Firth also spent time in, at the East West Center. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So that, mm -hmm. You know, Became, oh, it's uh, still a big center in Hawaii. Uh, and of course, Larry has a pioneering work there with, uh, you know, exactly with, uh, especially because of the Asian, uh, uh, you know, students. So from yeah. Korea, the Philippines, as you yeah. say, Japanese. Indonesia. So it's still very popular. Indonesia, yeah, Malaysia. Yeah. Korea. And, uh, and, you know, one thing is, whereas EIL didn't do so many recordings, this is one of the strengths of ELF, that you have the corpora. You have the mm -hmm. voice corpora for mm -hmm. Europe and you have the ace corpora for Asia. Do, do you, are you guys thinking of some kind of like South American corpora? Well, Lucy Ellen, Lucy Ellen has been working on a corpus. It's a still a small, but she, it's, a, it's her project at university here called BRACE, Brazilian Corpus of English. Wow, great. So, great. Yeah, and uh, that is even the website. It's a, it's a small... But it's mm -hmm. it's moving on, Good. so if, I can send you the link later if you want to have a oh, look please. at it. Yeah, please. brace. That's a, you know, it's got to be a clever name. You know, voice uh, ace. You know, Andy Andy, Kirkpa Andy Kirkpatrick, who started the Ace Corpus. The Ace you know, Corpus, yeah. Mm -hmm. As I say in the article, he studied Chinese as an undergraduate, and he was uh -huh. in for a long time. But they were Andy was going to call it Elf in Asia, Elf and then a small i and then a capital a right and right Harry Whittleson, who's seidelhofer's husband said oh you know that's just, that's too long you know no one's gonna remember that. so he it was said, a big yeah. name before right it was very long yeah yeah elf elfia <laughs> no uh -huh. one's gonna say that so henry yeah. said well, call it ace so your brace lucy uh -huh. brace is perfect yeah, but Andy also was into world Englishes because he published that book remember uh, world Englishes. And, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's why I lament a bit that so then, you know, because that's a nice university undergraduate type textbook, World mm -hmm. English. And then um, Jennifer Jenkins also produced a textbook called World Englishes. But see, she's, yeah. changed, she's changed that to Global Englishes. Yes. And, uh -huh. uh, and so people start, to, there is a chance that the younger ones will forget. So an interesting thing that just happened, let me see if I can, um, if I open the internet, there's a book coming out. Um, if I look at, um, it's with uh, Rutledge. You know, Ali Fuad Selvi? Yeah, sure, sure. He's in, in uh, Cyprus uh, or something? Cyprus, yes, yes. So this, sure. this is a brand new book that you guys might be interested in. Mm -hmm. And um, it's called Language Teacher Education for Global Englishes. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be very valuable. It has 48 units. And um, they asked, it, did, it said enlarge, but it didn't enlarge. It has 48 units. And they asked me to write the conclusion chapter. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of you know in a quandary over it because i i get a little see kingsley bolton again i don't know if you guys realize the tensions there there are competition competing sure issues sure there. yes and mm -hmm. kingsley bolton who since the katrus have passed away and larry smith he's kind of the leader of world Englishes. he's the editor mm -hmm, of the mm -hmm. journal with daniel davis and he's very anti global english is because it's kind of um taken away this domain of world Englishes, and and jennifer has made it the cover term the umbrella term to take in world english so mm -hmm, they put world mm -hmm. english as with eil and elf under global yeah. english and um and she even founded the global english uh, the global english center in southampton remember yes, so yeah. And see, and Gabriel Fang Fang is her student. But anyway, a, a, but the funny thing is, this is in a series. Um, I don't know if the series. This is called Rutledge Advances 
mm-hmm. in teaching English as an international language. Okay, is the series. Um, so it's a, it's a resource book, as I can see. But anyway, here, right? yeah, it's a resource book. It's got lesson plans. You know what it is? Right. It's a teacher training resource book. So right. professors in that are training English teachers from all over the world contributed um, chapters to this. So it's going to be a very useful thing. Right. But Jim, before you proceed, what is your what is your personal view on this? Uh, I know that he, when you mentioned that King uh, Bolton does not agree very much with that because he can overshadow the world English's yeah, term. Yeah. So, what is your personal view on this this you know this distinction? Global Englishes versus world Englishes. And, and you know what surprised me? Aya Matsuda wrote the introduction. And she's mm-hmm. a Mrs. EIO person. Mm-hmm. So, uh, she did her PhD with Margie Burns. Margie and, Burns, yes. Margie yes. Burns did her PhD with Yamuna Katru. Yes. So I am, you know, a strong world English as an EIO person. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And and if you look at Aya Matsuda's books, um, she's done several. Um, yeah, she's basically there. EIL. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, she's basically, but see, she's gone into the global Englishes. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm very surprised. Now, see, she, this was her first book with the orange cover. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, English Principles and Practices of Teaching English as an International Language, right, which has right. some lesson plans in the back. I have a chapter in this. Then, mm-hmm. like two years later, she comes out with this one, Preparing Teachers to Teach English as an International Language, very right. much you know, very much into the EIL and lots of teaching ideas. And also But, ELF. There are ELF, ELF scholars there see, also. Aya mm-hmm. was one of the people who was very anti-ELF in the beginning because she also interpreted it that it's pushing lingua franca English. Right, right. The, the world English's people also perceived ELF as something that's trying to kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's trying to, you know, <laughs> Uh, take away their domain, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm surprised. But what happened is in this green book, suddenly mm-hmm. uh, Galloway and Rose have a couple of units. So global English is now becomes a term in several of the chapters in this one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so when Ali Fuad asked me to write the, um, he, he had invited me on this book and then I didn't hear from them for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wasn't sure I could do it. Then later he asked me to write the conclusion and I looked at it and the original plan had Sandra McKay writing the conclusion, the EIL person. And for some reason she, she pulled out and the original title was EIL related because it's in an EIL series. So somehow um, the global English is people. Um, and you know, what's interesting is that, you know, TESOL, the huge TESOL organization. Mm-hmm. In America, mm-hmm. uh, not mm-hmm. yet, and yeah, TESOL, teachers teaching English to speakers of other languages. Aya mm-hmm. is active in that. She was on the board of directors, and you see Galloway and Rose, also the the key global Englishes people, often go and present at TESOL. So I think, mm-hmm. and Ali Fuad is also active, and uh, Bedretton, the co-author. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think somehow within TESOL, they sort of decided that global English is had the momentum mm-hmm. or really communicating to teachers. See, that's the problem is world English is EIL, ELF. None of it has really got to the tipping point where it influenced yeah. the majority of teachers. And so I think they decided, Aya basically said, look, I think global English is, is a better vehicle to mm. get this across to teachers and teacher training programs. So, um, So I talked to, I, I emailed with Aya. I was debating whether to write the conclusion. And I also consulted Mario Saracini. And he right. said, he wrote to me, said, look, we're all talking about the same thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? If you can change the way teachers teach English away from a native model and only teaching about native culture and things like that and focusing on errors that deviate from native usage, if you can get people away from that, It doesn't matter that much what it's called. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, our mission mm-hmm. has been successful. Yeah, but we, we these terms in many ways, especially when we think of the, the you know, the practitioner, 
the the teacher that is there uh you know trying to get familiar with all these concepts so it gets to be confusing mm -hmm. yeah so you need to simplify it in some way so in my conclusion uh -huh. I, actually, i actually make a graph where i show the professors at the um in the teacher training universities have to mm -hmm. have the knowledge they have to go all the way back to the larry smiths and the Tatrus and then come to the McKays and the Sharifians mm -hmm. and then the Jenkins and the Seidelhoffers and mm -hmm. finally to the Galloways and the Roses. And mm -hmm. then I said, now the students who are going to become teachers, mm -hmm. that, uh, okay, so the professors in the teacher training program, then the actual MA students in the teacher training program, they need to maybe um, have a familiarity with it, but not as deep. And mm -hmm. then finally, the actual, um, when they go out and be teachers, they have to be able to explain it, but maybe they present it from a global English perspective and don't confuse mm -hmm. the students in Spain or in Turkey or wherever. Yeah, and, yeah. And so ultimately, the final student who's learning English is not going to have the full confusing image of all these scholars and what they said. So maybe it's okay that the mm -hmm. student... Brazilian classroom understands it as global English is. Mm -hmm. But I see a risk there, you know what I mean? That eventually the uh, the forebears get lost. Right, right. But in your article, James, you you I believe, as you say here in the article, so elf is becoming, I mean, is spreading in a way in Japan. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. people are beginning to understand the paradigm as more, let's say uh applicable let's i don't know if this is the right term to the to the you know to the context there yeah, especially yeah. in school so can you say something about this um what well, yeah again like in india in a world english's outer circle setting they don't talk that much about elt how mm -hmm. to teach because already all the teachers are locals right mm -hmm. and you go on the philippines what you're learning is The teacher's Philippine English. When you go mm -hmm. to Nigeria, you're learning the teacher's Nigerian English. But in, in Japan, you still bring in a lot of native speakers. And, and uh -huh. you know what I mean? So they're still using American English as the model. Right. So well, you, you mentioned this, yeah. but uh, I would, sorry for interrupting, but uh, mm -hmm. this is important because sometimes we, we uh, of course, here, this happens also in Brazil. The native speaker, the native speaker is still a big asset, especially in terms of uh, marketing and, uh, you know, language institutes, Engl ELT, uh, lang English institutes, advertising, the you know, because they have native speaker teachers, et cetera, et cetera. But then, We have, I would say, we have advanced a little bit in, in you know, in, in trying to overcome this mm -hmm. this uh, situation in which the native speaker is always the, you know, the best teacher. Or, mm -hmm. but I, 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 from what you say in the article, this is something still strong in Japan, or it's changing. I think it's fairly strong. Um, you know, the uh -huh. the language schools, the English conversation schools, still have the um, you know, the blonde haired, blue eyed teacher on the poster, and even Chukyo, mm -hmm. they, even though I don't have blonde hair, they <laughs> still use me in the you know, because again, if you use another Asian, um, they can't really tell that it doesn't look international to them. Mm -hmm. it looks mm -hmm. like another, you know, if there's a teacher from um singapore the the chinese face maybe it looks like another japanese student mm -hmm. but i was impressed recently that um the jet program i mentioned this in the article where they bring in all the foreign teachers uh -huh. that are really native speakers but if you look at the data it's up to like 15 percent non-inner circle teachers in the jet program and i looked at a video if you search do you mind if i search quickly uh Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I was showing my students Black Rain the other day, but um, where, where's the one? Where's the play? Oh, here it is. Uh, there's a video, and it's interesting where they show the people coming from. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it might be this one. Uh, here it is. This this is the official video the of the program. It, mm-hmm. They call it the yeah the, the Japan Exchange Program, and Japan is so rich they're able to bring in. You know, huge the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program. It? Yes. is aimed at promoting grassroots international look at, exchange. Look at this video of the teachers. Mm-hmm. And you see, it's not the blue-eyed, the blonde-haired. Really. Uh-huh. Between Japan and other nations. It is administered through the collaboration of Japan's Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Education, Culture, Sports, Science and Technology, and the Council of Local Authorities for International Relations. Since its start in 1987, JIT has grown into one of the largest international exchange programs in of the world. Of course, you do have an American accent. As the yes, narrator. exactly. Yeah, I was going to say that even the narrator is American. Oh, it what, has an American accent. What, what Hona always says is, why don't you have an educated Japanese English speaker as the narrator? Exactly, exactly, yeah. Inviting nearly 68,000 people from 73 countries for up to five years each to Japan. Participants perform one of three roles, assistant language teachers, ALTs, coordinators for international relations, CIRs, and sports exchange advisors, SEAs. Mm-hmm. My name is Donna Lynn Cielo Rasa Let's see, here we got Donna Lynn Cielo Lampa with the Philippine flag. So you know what I mean? Uh-huh. The, the, jet, the JET program itself is showcasing the not the native speaker, which is great, you know. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I serve as an ALT, so that's Assistant Language Teacher. Higashikawa's basic education system and lifelong learning system is quite dynamic, actually. So apart from our functions at the schools, we also have after-school English clubs. So we expose children to um, env- an, an environment and, you know, where they if, can if use English And, you know, if it's only native speakers, it's dangerous because then the Japanese, of course, they have their regular Japanese English teacher. Their normal uh-huh. class, uh-huh. and they do the jets do co-teaching with the Japanese teacher. So right, the student, the young students tend to look to the native speaker, and that puts the local teacher in a weaker position. Right. You know, uh-huh. but I'm glad that they now. Now, at, first there's this Philippine girl. Then you'll see they uh, now. Here's the second one. That's <laughs> It's good though they show the multilingualism too because Japanese people watching this video, even though they had subtitles, uh, mm-hmm. now they have subtitles when the Japanese teacher is speaking. Mm-hmm. Interpretation, uh, social media. Um, I teach English sometimes. This is the second girl. Mm-hmm. To people outside of school, and I also am an advisor for. She's Japanese a Japanese American. Japanese American, yeah. Uh huh. He does have that Asian face. Uh, yes. They're not just getting the blonde-haired, blue-eyed people. Um, so, I see some progress. Mm-hmm. That they're bringing in, say, fifteen percent of jets from non-inner circle countries, and they're also showcasing them on the video. So you do you do see a change, but. Uh, it lags behind the theory. You know. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there any, for example, any official uh, evaluation or in terms of uh, reactions to, to students, to these, um, you know, different, different nationals, for example, okay, this is an assistant. She, she speaks English, but she's from the Philippines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see uh, the student evaluations of different jets uh-huh. and how entrenched the attitudes are of the students. Um, uh-huh. that, that's why I, I got one of my fourth year students to do her um, graduation thesis on the jet situation. And mm-hmm. he, he was able to access about um, 60 jet teachers mm-hmm. and, and do an attitude survey. Um, from the teacher's perspective, but it would be great to get, and I, I'm sure, I have a feeling they do gather data at the ministry. So yeah. it, might, it might be an interesting research project to try to get access or, or even to, for them to let you go in. Yeah, yeah, that would be very interesting because you can consider inner 
let's say the uh, what I'm calling the traditional, as you say, the blondie, blue-eyed, traditional inner circle, non-traditional inner circle, and also outer mm -hmm. circle, right? So as the Philippines and, and, and also the several African uh, uh, countries, as you mentioned here, South Africa, Botswana, yeah. Uganda, etc. So that would be interesting. Yeah, that's why, you know, I liked, I mentioned in the article here that um, I was invited to give a talk. You see, mm -hmm. they, they have training. These people are not teachers. They graduate, they're middle class college graduates, mainly from Australia, Canada, U.S. Right. And, and they come and they, they might be a psychology graduate and they're just put in as these assistant language teachers and they, they have no teacher training. Um, uh -huh. so it's not the best system in the world. Um, I, I lost my train of thought there, what I was going to say about them. Oh, so my, a former exchange student at, at Chukyo, James Keeger, was a jet. And he, see, some of them work in the office. He was one of the office type people helping to coordinate other jets. And mm -hmm. he knew about mm -hmm. world Englishes from Chukyo. So he invited me to come and talk at the training session. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here's a guy, again, a jet himself <laughs> inviting because he feels that the, um, that the other jet teachers need to hear the world English's angle on things because they don't uh -huh. have any training. And the great thing is when I went to this session, you know, it's a typical conference. There's some people giving papers, but there's also the poster area. Mm -hmm. And di different jets were giving presentations, poster presentations on their teaching ideas. And I was so happy to see the black faces, you know, and the uh, Asian faces. And, and I asked them where they have name cards and they say, I'm from Kenya and I'm from Sri Lanka. And so I could uh -huh. actually see this 15% that I read about. I actually see the jets coming from the outer circle. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and some mm -hmm. were from Finland, you know, places like that, Holland. Uh, because these days, uh, Katru's model is kind of behind the times because some of the North European countries um, actually have more people speak English well than they do in Nigeria or India, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, in India, I don't think it's barely 20% of the population speaks yeah. English. So Because it's such a huge population and some people aren't even in school at all. Yeah. You know, the literacy rate is getting better, but it's still only about 70% or something. Yes, like. yes, yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But then, Jim, you mentioned also that... Uh, you know, the about, uh, I would like you to say something about the, there is this volume that came out, I think was last year mm -hmm. on English as a lingua franca in Japan towards oh, multilingual yeah. practices. So if you, if you could tell us, uh, I have, I have just seen a few chapters. Yeah, it's uh, it's a Palgrave. Uh... I think Widdowson uh, and Barbara has written a chapter also, right? You know why? Because have you ever seen Murata, who I talk about quite a bit? Yes. Uh, yes. Professor Kumi. Mm -hmm. uh, she, if for the other members, she is uh, at Waseda, which is an elite university. She just retired. But uh, yeah. Kumiko mm -hmm. Murata is, um, this is her. It's not the greatest uh, picture but um yeah, yeah and you can see her books english medium instruction from an english as a language yes mm -hmm. like a mm -hmm. chapter, but murata is at waseda and um, she was in she was in finland and i remember her presentation yeah. yeah but anyway she did her phd with widowson that's uh -huh. the connection so uh, -huh. uh she herself was not working in elf until about a dozen years ago. And then um, I, I think Widow Sensi is married to Seidelhofer. So she probably keeps in touch with Henry Widowson. Mm -hmm. And he told her, um, boy, this elf is really a, a dynamic um, paradigm. And so she suddenly totally went into elf and she got major grants. Yeah. They're called mm -hmm. ASPS. And I mentioned the grants in the article. And yes. she got three-year grants four times in a row. And what she did was she would always invite the big names. You know, over 12 years, she's had uh, lots of, I, I'll tell her to invite you next time. But she now with Corona, 
It's not <laughs> easy to invite, but all you know, all of the big names, uh, many of them have been to speak um, at Waseda. Um, so uh -huh, she's uh -huh. been very um, influential. But anyway, she retired, so that's why they produced this book. It's a this kind book. of festival yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. in her honor. This is the book, and I think they have the um, yeah, they have the table of contents here. So again, if you're looking for data about elf interactions in Japan, I think this is a good source. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. As I said, it's with Palgrave and it's edited by two nice people, uh, Konakahara and Suchia, who both mm -hmm. were, I think, PhD students. But let's see, I wrote the foreword, which is, I hate when you write a foreword, they don't put it in the table of contents. You oh, know, they, they that's not fair. The table of contents. Yeah, isn't that unfair? But I wrote the foreword. They asked me to write uh -huh. chapter 15 or something. And then when they got it, they said, oh, this is such a nice tribute to Kumiko. Could we make it the foreword? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you've got here's elf education, uh, language policy and planning related things. Um, mm -hmm. Again, as ELT related um, Tomokazu did his PhD with Jenkins to Ishikawa. Um, uh -huh. So that would be uh, a good idea. But there are, I uh, see, look, show next 13. There's a lot of chapters. So I uh, see now you're looking at accommodation. Th this is a, yeah. act, this is the jet type thing. Accommodation during, um, accommodation during team teaching in a primary mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. must be looking at how the native speaker or how the outer circle teacher and the jet and the Japanese right. teacher, uh, mm -hmm. accommodate uh, analyzing discourse in EMI courses. EMI, uh -huh. Like my new major, I mean, EMI goes so well with ELF. Yeah. As I say in the chat, because you have people from all these different countries, uh, you know, like Australia Malaysia. Uh, does Brazil have some EMI program? Yeah, we do. We EMI? do. We do. And Jim, uh, before we take questions, because it's 11 already, before we take questions right, from right. the audience, I'd like you to touch uh, for us to get, you know, uh, some insights on that. Uh, two topics. One issue, well, you both mentioned them and you just mentioned EMI. How, how, EMI, uh, you know, how, how big is EMI in Japan? Mm -hmm. And also, uh, if you could talk a little bit about the, you know, uh, in this context of ELF, what do you, mm -hmm. when you mention here, for example, the, because it seems to me that there is still a lot of importance related to assessment exams Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, the, the international exams that you mentioned, like TOEIC and, and, and TOEFL. So, yes, yeah. and also uh, saying something that I keep saying also that we need, even when we think of the common European framework, we need to go for local solutions concerning this. Not only assessment, as, as and you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, our friend uh, Shohami, right? And, and she was in Greece, if you oh, remember. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how, how do you see this uh, EMI and also in terms of assessment exams within the, 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 the ELF context? And then after you do this, we are going to take a couple of questions okay. from the audience. All right. Let, let me show you because, you know, as I read the way this book is structured, each uh -huh. chapter has like one major scholar of global Englishes or ELF give an introduction then the teachers do their resource chapters right and are you familiar with guang wei who i think is the name um let me see if i can find his name i for me this was the most impressive testing chapter i had seen um let me do a control f and see oh, there is a brazilian here Ana Raquel. she's from brazil Where did you find her? Uh, oh, here. Uh, listening to listening as a gateway in in the book. I don't know why my control F is not working like it usually. Ana <laughs> Raquel Fialho and Marcia Regina Carazai. You can find them. Huh? Whoops. Yeah. Where is it? Number what? One point? Can you see? Uh, is it down further? No, here, uh, one point. 
Let's see. After uh, 1.3, listening oh, as a gateway. Oh, there it is. Oh, I see. Okay. And that's a, uh, um, these are Brazilian scholars? Yeah, yeah, they're Brazilian. Mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. Raquel Fialho Ferreira Campos. Ferreira Campos, yes, yes. Uh -huh. But yeah, this Guangwei Hu, do you see something about testing? Um, see, see, it's a huge uh -huh. lecture. I think it's, uh, here it is, language assessment. This guy, Guangwei Hu, uh -huh. he, again, has a brilliant way of suggesting functional. And Sefer is, you know, what you can do. Mm -hmm. So this has a very good chapter suggesting design the tests according to what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, so I would, I would recommend looking at the work of, uh, but yeah, localizing it is not, it depends on the purpose of the test, right? If you want to go to graduate school in Australia, mm -hmm. then it may not make sense to have a Brazilian English based um, test. But again, they asked me, I have a podcast coming up. They said, is there something unique about Japanese elf? And I said, well, in a way, elf is elf. Japanese speakers will have issues. But once you get people from, you know, imagine an EMI class with people from 12 different countries and there's 35 students. Um, it, it's a pretty big pool sample of different varieties coming together. And then... Uh, how can they be effective in that situation? So even in Brazil or Japan, if a test could be developed, you know, for example, react to a situation, uh -huh. right? Like you could even make them multiple choice. You know, right. you could set up an intercultural type situation. You know, uh, this person from uh, a Muslim country says they need to pray to the teacher in the middle of tomorrow's class, you know, what might be the best way to handle it? You know, mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. if so and so says this, and what do you think they really mean? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You could you could even set up multiple choice questions that judge students' ability to uh, interpret what the intention of the message was. It, it might not and, and of course in a writing, they do have writing sections now. Mm -hmm. So you could set up a little scenario and say, you know, what would you, how would you respond? You know, it almost becomes like a speech act test. Right, you know, right. What would, mm -hmm. what would be an appropriate way to respond to this? Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, check out this work of Guangwei Hu because he's okay. suggested mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 But it's important, the testing, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. And even for, for materials production, mm -hmm. so we, uh, the, we, we've been trying to see alternatives here mm -hmm. in terms of parameters mm -hmm. because the common European framework is still, you know, uh, through the textbooks that we import. Mm -hmm. So the common uh, European framework is still the, let's say, the main guidance. But we... Well, but there are scholars working on, on alternatives. You notice with the with the Sephar, um, they took out all mention of native speakers in this new one called the Companion. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Which is which is a good thing, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. positive. And it's about it's about what you can do, you know, not it it's yeah. not so much about act, it's about or who, argument. who who you could imitate, right? <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Jim, I'm going to uh, to open up. Thank you for, for this, you. this great, uh, you know, interaction. I'm going to open up here. We have uh, Vanessa and Danielle with us in the room. Okay. And we have questions from, from uh, you know, from, from the audience in the, on the channel. So, okay. Daniel, if you want to, to ask Jim any questions, so you go ahead, Vanessa also, and then we take questions from the people outside. Yes, please. James, thank you very much. I love your article. It's very interesting. Sometimes we get so focused on our reality here in South America and Brazil that we kind of forget the, the reality of other, other countries, especially in Asia, which you're so far away from us. Right? But uh, reading your article, I realized that there are so many similarities between Brazil and Japan 
Mm -hmm. uh, we are both in the expanding circle. We have never been colonized. Mm -hmm. English has no official status here in Brazil. Uh, and we use it in, in very few internal domains like education, commerce. So um, we're still debating if we have a Brazilian English or not. No, no. And, uh, and you mentioned in your article that ELF is centrally concerned with how users of English from different international backgrounds using their own idiolect of English come together to negotiate meaning and accommodate to one another to reach mutual understanding. Uh, doing languaging and uh, idiomatizing in real time right. fashion. So you put it in a way that is so clear that I ask myself, why is it so difficult for us to embrace ELF? Because it, it, it's for us, the way you put it, it sounds that it's for us, right? And you mentioned that in Japan's reality, you mentioned that uh, the, the scholars uh, reluctance uh, in spite of their ability to write and deliver academic papers in English, mm -hmm. uh, reluctance to actually use English in a classroom and you also mentioned that uh, Japanese are, are very uh, reticent to speak out in front of, yeah, in front yeah. uh, to others. Uh, and, and it's interesting. So I would like you to talk about uh, the difficulties in Japan of, mm -hmm. for embracing ELF. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Which are similar to here, right? Right, right. Yes, uh, yes, that, that's, what I, similar. What I wanna, yeah, that's what I want to see. He has four questions in that question. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, James. I'm sorry. I was following it through the first two. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it, it is. Uh, some people think elf is still some sort of deficit variety that's, you know, anything goes or um, that it should be a reduced code. This is what uh, Jenkins and Seidelhofer argued that, um, you know, look at what Latin was for Galileo and Copernicus, you know, for the greatest scholars in the world used, that was their lingua franca, Latin. So uh, using ELF doesn't mean that, you know, again, you're using a simplified kind of English. So we need to promote it to people in a way that says, you know, the most so sophisticated, if you're in an EMI situation, you might have to make the readings a little bit shorter, but the content uh, does not need to be dumbed down. Um, and, and, and the world is moving towards this. I think as we move towards CLIL, you know, you see it's more and more popular to have content and language integrated learning. And um, so within that, you know, teaching the skills, you know, teaching the reading class and the oral communication class and the listening class, we're moving a bit away from that towards uh, content-based instruction, even if it's not EMI. So I, I think ELF uh, fits with that nicely. But yeah, in Japan, you still have the people who um, think, you know, you have to promote accuracy and things like that. But yeah, g give me the crux of your question again, because it was long. And what, it, it, uh, was, it was a very similar question to Arnon's in YouTube. So I'm going to ask his question because it's very similar to what I'd like also you to talk about. So Arno on YouTube, he says, since Japan was not a country colonized by native English speaking countries, what stands out in terms of elf acceptability in relation to countries colonized by native English speaking countries? What, can you read that one more time? The last part? Yeah, What's... yeah, of course. Uh, what stands out in terms of elf acceptability in relation to countries colonized by native English speaking countries? Okay, so what's the difference in a way? Well, well the countries yeah. na uh, colonized by native speaking countries, again, they tend not to be that interested in ELF. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because, th at least with world English, is the focus is in how is English used within Singapore? How is English used within India? And how can we uh, codify and describe uh, Nigerian English so that people accept it? and they accept that it has different phonology, it has lexical creativity, there's certain mm. syntactic differences. So in the countries colonized by native speaker countries, um, again, they, they still have a complex sometimes. You know, mm -hmm. Philippine people still sometimes feel that Philippine English is not that good. Ironically, you know, you would think that you know 
Singapore, even Singapore had the speak good English movement. And they were, you know, Lee Kuan Yew was saying, hey, national business. So, um, and like Brother Gonzalez in the Philippines said, a lot of the uh, unique syntax actually starts as errors. And then it gets, a stout, the Philippines has a wide range of, especially with prepositions, right. they use them in a very different way from uh, most native speakers. But I point out to people, the British say at the weekend and Americans say on the weekend. On so the weekend, yeah. Native varieties are using things the same way. Um, so it, it, it's quite different context when you look at the countries colonized by, um, but, but see, you know, what Larry Smith said is Americans need to learn to use English as an international language as much as Japanese or Brazilians do, because again, you're trying to find a middle ground. It's not foreigner talk. You're not like lowering your English to speak to the non-native speaker. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You actually have to make it more educated and use less uh, what you gonna do, you know, what do you, what do you say? There was a textbook in Japan and the name, name of the textbook was, what do you say? Mm -hmm. And they were trying to teach, the whole textbook was trying to teach that connected speech with the elision and, you know, cutting things out. And, you know, some teachers actually felt that's what you have to learn. But if an American is speaking like that in a business meeting at, at Mercedes Benz in Europe, he may actually be the least educated. Yeah, haven't you heard Americans with, well, it's kind of like, you know, well, it's sort of, well, you know. I, I have a student, an Australian Japanese student who spent eight years in Japan and there's no content. She's so nativized and all she's saying is like and kind of, you know. So um, it, it, it's very different kind of context, I think. Yeah, and also when you mentioned Singapore, uh, 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 Jim, there is also this whole uh, controversy and uh, this dispute related to Singlish, right? Uh -huh. Because you have, you, you, you know, I would say probably Singapore, and, and I could see this from your article, Singapore uh, has a strong influence in the area. So, for example, uh, I, I saw here that the students uh, go to Singapore to, to, yeah. to in an exchange programs, right? So maybe that's, yeah, that's for us to show them, you know, here's an example of an outer circle country where people are confident using their English. And, uh -huh. and so it definitely changes their mindset, but they don't completely change their mindset until they actually go into the business world. Mm -hmm. And then they realize, oh my God, you know, I'm speaking to Malaysians and Germans and French and Thais and, uh, you know, they were right at the College of World English. Is it? It's not about accuracy. Uh -huh. it's, about, it's about how well you know your field. Uh -huh. Have you ever heard the, the chairman of Nissan who was disgraced? He's actually part Brazilian. Yeah. But yeah. Carlos, yeah. I love Carlos Gono. I always use him as the example of yeah. the perfect elf. He's, he's, in, he's in his home. I mean, his first yeah. home country yeah. now, right? Bugging them out in a box. His escape and, was... Uh, James Bond type of, of yeah. operation. <laughs> but, you know, there's tapes, uh, there's books with a CD of him in his business meetings. And uh -huh. again, as Henry Widdowson calls, the, the elf user is going to use, he calls them non-conformities. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. English was always looking, okay, they're not errors. Uh, they're not mistakes. Maybe they're deviations. Right, uh, right. Maybe creativity but Widowson's idea of non-conformities non -conformities, yes yeah is great so and and so you see he knows his field so well uh -huh. and he negotiates so well so he's mm -hmm. using English at a very high very effective level but there's going to be uh, things that don't fit with uh, and don't forget every native speaker is not an educated user of English Exactly, exactly. You know? uh -huh. That's why I see Singlish actually is the basilectal Singapore English. People yeah. think people think Singapore English is Singlish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But Singlish mm -hmm. is the very mixed, you know, code mixed, code switch. Exactly, code exactly. For the marketplace. Um, there's, a, there's a great movie called Just Follow Law. Mm -hmm. You know, there's leaving out Just Follow the Law. In Singapore, it's a comedy. But the interesting thing is it's a government ministry. 
and they have the cleaning staff and they have the regular clerical staff and then they have the managerial staff and they're Indians and Malays and Chinese. And you see the acrolectal Singapore English, the mesolectal Singapore English, the acrolect mm -hmm. by the managers, kind of the, the mm -hmm. I mean, it is true. That it's not anything goes. I mean, your English has to be educated like Blue Mart says in his, the sociolinguistics of globalization. People will uh -huh. judge you by your English, but not mm -hmm. by native standards necessarily, but by how educated it is. So yeah. You can still sound Singaporean, but, and you know this, Savio, when we go to conferences, you'll find, um, again, you'll find uh, Edgar Schneider from Germany speaks, when he gives a presentation, it's much better than my presentation because he has, <laughs> 50,000 citations and I have 260 and there's a reason for that and so you hear Anne Pakir from Singapore uh -huh. you, know, you hear one of the Indian scholars and they're more articulate than I am even though mm -hmm. it's not a native yeah variety. yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah okay and thank then, you James Daniel can you I think we have a couple of more questions no yeah yes yeah. and, and it's related to what James was just saying uh, Kelly is asking uh, about uh, India, actually. Uh, does it mean that people in India recognize or value the local teacher practice? I mean, instead of overestimating the native teacher? You know, it's interesting. Uh, again, Hona, um, I can write it in the chat here, but... Um, oh, I see there's some chat. Um, there's a scholar called Parashar. If you, I think I use it in my, my PhD thesis, you can download from the Northwest University if you go to Google Scholar, but uh, mm -hmm. can you see that? Parashar is a scholar who did a, a big questionnaire in India. And he asked, uh, you know, pretty educated people, what variety of English, he asked Indians, what variety of English would you like to speak? You know, British, English, um, American English, or the English of educated Indians? And Hona loved to use this because I think 68% of the people said they'd like to speak the English of educated Indians. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, when you like, you know, who I like to play is uh, what is it? Amber, who's the famous industrialist? I'm trying to think. Uh, um, he's a president. It's like, um, from um, where Johnny or something like this um, but you know that's what I do for my students in the world English's introduction class uh, I oh, Umber, Umber Johnny something. oh it's the it's the, the 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 Indian billionaire right yeah it's I don't think I spelled it right but like Tata you know the big industrial combine yes, Tata, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. this Am Johnny or Amber Johnny he does a really nice interview and, you, you know, you hear that the educated Indian English is because that's your identity. Yes, exactly. You know I mean? If you if you're speaking, um, if you're an Indian speaking British English. Um, it sounds weird, have, right? Yeah, th there's a novel called A Suitable Boy. Uh, and in, that's why it pays sometimes to read the literature from. Uh -huh. the, it's called A Suitable Boy. And right. in that novel. Um, the person who, the one really elite older brother who speaks British English is kind of teased and mm -hmm. ridiculed. And they, like in Andy Kirkpatrick's book, he presents four varieties of Nigerian English. Yeah. And the highest mm -hmm. one, which is like the British English, is not socially acceptable. Exactly, because, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. so and this same. happens in many contexts. It yeah. sounds like snobbish, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, you're losing your identity. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, Vanessa has a question for you. Yes, Vanessa. The Indians seem to like their. Yes. Good morning, Danjel. Good, uh, good morning, Savio. And Hello. Daniel. Good morning. Good morning, Vanessa. Vanessa uh, is a public school teacher here in Salvador, uh, James. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to make a comment uh, on part of your article here, D'Angelo, that is, uh, I will read the part, okay? Uh, as Winderson... Which page uh, is that, uh, Vanessa, please? 363. Okay. 363. Yeah, to the very end of the page. Okay. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. 
As Uiro Song uh, perceptibly points out, the speech and writing of most users of English around the world today will be filled with he terms with what he terms non-conformities. Uh, uh -huh. These are not errors per se, but forms of English that influenced by a different reality from that of non-native speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I'd like to comment because that's what I'm interested about. Yeah, um, I, I'd like to uh, direct my research on writing. And mm -hmm. it seems that writing is an untouchable thing. I, I don't know if you oh, know yeah. what yeah. I mean, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, when you write in a certain mm -hmm. way or in a certain form, people tend to judge you uh, there mm -hmm. uh, concerning the level of your writing, mm -hmm. as yeah. judging it as a high level of writing or a low level of writing, mm -hmm. yeah? Especially- yeah, less flexibility with the writing. And yeah. that what's really uh, worried me also, uh, not only as a teacher, uh, but also as a, an English speaker. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you know that we have these international exams that mm -hmm. are still uh, native-like native basis. Uh, these norms are native-like basis. And then that's, I think that you have a great challenge ahead concerning mm -hmm. this. And I'd mm -hmm. like you to make a comment on this, Nigel, please. Yeah, it, it, writing is an area where even when I look at my graduation theses, uh, theses I, I'm a bit, le I become a native speaker again because the, the errors sort of jump out at me in the writing. And um, I think, you know, one thing Widowson says is the more you do something, um, you you learn from the other people so again like you, i think it's fine with the younger students you you should correct the obvious gr grammatical errors but maybe um like have them write a diary where you correct the more obvious errors but then you know you don't maybe correct every single error you find because you've like when the red pen gets or use a different color from red you know if they write in black use blue and um you know give them not an over don't overload them with the number of corrections they have to fix but people will this is what widowson says is people will adjust their model um he, he mentioned something called uh valence uh communicative valency or valence and uh, it's kind of the value, the community. Right, says, right. Mm -hmm. foreign, foreign learners, um, their grammar is remarkably good, actually, because they focus on the grammar that has communicative power. Mm -hmm. And say the articles and prepositions, uh, you know, so they're very good with usually with present tense, past tense, mm -hmm. and um, basic word order. But then, um, you know, they're terrible with uh, and the and their prepositions. And so what he, what he says is the more they do it, the more they'll adjust their model. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not, it's not necessarily toward a native model. It's towards, again, the educated or the school model. Mm -hmm. And the school model, doesn't have, it's just um, English that makes grammatical sense that's not necessarily based on a native model. Um, yeah. So, so I think, I think yeah. As, yeah. It's nice when you refer to this, Jim, because I think, uh, you know, I, journals and, and uh, several publications should be more, let's say, sensitive to this when they invite, for example, uh, yeah. writers or scholars from different parts of the world. And, uh, you know, instead of really, you know, uh, establishing a standard where it makes sense what people are saying towards a more, let's say, as you mentioned, educated English, not native like English, you see? And that's why there is this, this just complaint all over the world that people dump excellent papers sometimes because, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't reach the native like standard. So I think, you know, I think ELF, will contribute, health research will contribute to this maybe and provoke some changes, at least in our area, I believe. 
And look at the, the Nordic scholars are the ones, Anna Morena in Finland, but also I can't think of the name right now. Um, mm -hmm. The ones from Norway and Sweden that work with Anna are doing uh -huh. work on, actually Anna has a corpus called RELFA, uh, the written yeah. corpus. Mm -hmm. of, uh, academic, uh, academic English, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so they are looking at that. Um, and I get, when I get papers from Asian Englishes, I'm conscious of that try to see through if the if they're not using the appropriate register um th but still try to look through the content and the yeah 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 and the source mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i think have, then, sometimes having an elf there. scholar behind this whole story it makes a difference <laughs> yeah uh, certain journals like the i think the journal of nordic studies or something decided that they were going to make elf just elf eyes uh -huh. there Right, right. We have we have the Jelf, right? That uh, Barbara okay. Zeidelhoff is is also uh, behind it. So I think we can we can improve in this sense, hopefully slowly. But I think and, we will. and sometimes I tell them, uh, get your article checked by a more experienced international scholar. I don't say get a native check. Natives, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm, that. mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. the, you know, if it's from India, have your article checked by. Uh, an India, an older India scholar who um, right. has more publishing internationally. Yeah, yeah, we, because the tradition is to ask a native speaker that sometimes is not even from the area, right? They don't know the they area. Yeah, and they just, oh, just check my English here. So this is so, I think this is so impregnated with tradition that I think elf research has to contribute. Well, there are many, many uh, areas where we contribute, but this is one that I think it's it's very important. So, and I agree with you. So show someone who has the experience, not necessarily, you That's know, right. just a native speaker to check the grammar, you know, word order or whatever. Yeah. Good. Daniel, do we, do we still have any, any other questions for Jim? We are approaching the, you know, we said more or less 90 minutes. Yeah, we do have a question here in the chat. I don't know who uh -huh. made it actually, but it's here. Can I read it? Sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I am interested in international mobility programs. The data show that approximately 60% of Japanese students who study abroad go to English speaking countries, mainly to the USA, Canada, Australia, and UK, where English proficiency is required through standard exams such as TOEFL, Cambridge, etc. Mm -hmm. Chukyu University is a member of the International Student Exchange Programs community which requires proof of English proficiency through these exams. How is this issue developing a new kind of proficiency for Japanese users versus international requirements for proof of standard proficiency addressed by the School of World Englishes? Oh, How do you prepare but... your students so they may be able to participate in these exchange programs? Wow. This must be one of my colleagues. Uh, yeah, probably it's a question from, yeah. from somewhere there in Japan. They That's good. That's good. Well. Mm -hmm. um, for our one year, see, we have two kinds of programs. We have semester overseas, where all you need is a TOEFL of 500, mm -hmm. which is quite low. Mm -hmm. So the, the students who are not able to reach, you know, the higher levels they can still go on a semester overseas. And um, you know what's interesting, when they go overseas to America, all their friends are from Brazil and Korea and Turkey <laughs> and Saudi Arabia. When they go to Korea, all their friends are Americans and British. We actually have one university in Korea, that you, which is an EMI-based university. But anyway, mm -hmm. for the one-year exchange, the, the cutoff, you have to reach at least 61 points on the TOEFL IBT, which is like Sephar, um, it's a B1, kind of middle to high B1, which is mm -hmm. not that. So some of our kids do manage to get 68 or 74 or 75. So I would say, um, and, and again, our program, um, the, we have pretty good writing courses. It, it has been skills-based. And we do have the content-based courses like I teach, but you can't avoid that you have to score fairly decently on, the, on those tests. But, you know what I mean? If you can get 65, 
that still means you're you're able to go on one year exchange. So the test is not it's a gatekeeper, but it's not keeping out. It's not saying you have to you know, reach what TOEFL thinks is a B two level, which starts around mm -hmm. seventy two or something like that. So, so, and then the thing is, when they go overseas on ISEP, it's true that maybe most of them are in the inner circle, but a lot of our students used to go to Finland mm -hmm. and they would go to uh, Austria and they would go to Italy. They go to um, uh, Venice. Mm -hmm. So once they get over there, you know what I mean? So that that, that test is still going to be a hurdle that you have to pass and you, you have to face that. But, you know, maybe you can view it as, okay, well, these tests will be changing. They're starting to introduce Australian speakers and not just, you know, maybe South African speakers, but you're still going to have to get over the hurdle of that test. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But once you get overseas, you're going to be in a, pretty much you're going to be in an elf type situation and the content will become more mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so, but we still, again, world English as an elf doesn't mean anything goes. We're trying to develop these students to be educated speakers of Japanese yeah. English. So the, as mm -hmm. Vanessa asked mm -hmm. about with the writing, yeah, you do need, um, you know, Edwin Tumbu, have you ever heard of him? He was the poet yeah. laureate yeah. of Singapore and, and one of Kachu's early friends. He wrote the poem on the Mer lion, mm -hmm. and which lion fish that has the fountain coming out in Singapore and he said he's a literature guy and he talked about ASEAN poets that write in English in ASEAN and he said you have to learn um, a, a large group of basic connections he referred to grammar as connections the way English fits things together and once you you master those kind of connections that allows you to have the creativity to write poetry mm -hmm. in, in Philippine, in this kind of sophisticated Philippine idiom. Like, did you ever hear of Gemino Abad? Um, he's one of the, uh, my mouse is not working too well, but uh, Gemino Abad um, talks about how his English poetry um, can express the Philippine heart mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the, the people like, who's the famous Nigerian writer? Um, oh, that's Shinu Ashebi? Yeah, yeah. He talks about how we can express our African heart. Yeah, through, yeah. The, you know, so, but, it, you know, you'll have, to, you'd still do have to get the basic connections. You know, mm -hmm. English is still English in a lot of ways, whatever the variety, you know. Yeah, she, Ashebi says that uh, despite the ancestry of the English language mm. for Nigerians, so mm. English has to take the, the African experience. Yeah. So, so you, there is no yeah. other way. Mm -hmm. so one, one day we will have a, a global test of English, we hope. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, well, thank you for uh, this question. question. It was uh, was someone whose initials was uh, were oh, yeah, MD. Uh, Milena Brum from she, ah, she tried Mi to ask the question. Ah, it was Milena. Ah, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. She did her mm -hmm. research well. Yeah, yeah. she's tried our to ask colleague. The on YouTube, but she couldn't, so she came. She ah, came. okay. Yes, yes. She does a lot. she does a great work on mobility, international mobility, I with see. the University of Felix Santana. Yeah. So, uh, WEF is uh, great. Thank you, Milena. You know, the amazing question. thing is, you think, okay, the majority of the kids are going to the inner circle, but the connections they're making for their future are mainly with the other international students from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, and the, they'll be very useful in their future business. So, it's, you know, some students think, I'm going to America, I'm going to have all these blonde haired, blue eyed friends. <laughs> And that's not the way it works out. Only if you go to Korea, those will be your I, classmates. <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, Daniel, anything else there from, from our uh, YouTube uh, channel? There is one final question from Kelly. Can okay, I, so let's take this final question. Okay. And then, 
And then we can close. This will be the hardest thing. Right? Kelly, she asks, uh, James, in the article, you have mentioned something related to the importance of building up steps, some actions, attitudes to increase the status of ELF in Japan. Mm -hmm. Is there any resistance from professors, teachers, leading business professionals? There's definitely resistance from um, the native teachers, ironically. Well, some, maybe sometimes the Japanese teachers. But um, yeah, the, a lot of the native teachers, uh, and again, Japan, it's changing. They're, like You never had, used to have to have a PhD to get a job to teach uh, at university. You just needed a master's degree. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of foreigners, you know, these jets stay in Japan, even though they don't have a master's degree. And then mm -hmm. eventually they get a master's degree. Um, but yeah, you, one, some of my colleagues, when I did my PhD, they said, I said, I said, how could world Englishes or ELF inform your teaching? And one of the people who I know hates world Englishes, he said, World English is, is, an, is a linguistics, a field of linguistics. It has nothing to do with teaching language. There's no, no implications for teaching. Uh -huh, so you do get uh -huh. the, the, um, I suppose a fair number of the Japanese teachers will still, you know, because they study grammar so much. They're experts. Yeah, yeah. They can explain grammar much better than I can. And um, so they, they may get, so, but somehow the um, the testing the university tests have to change in Japan and they're doing that now mm -hmm, but, uh, mm -hmm. so again if the university test is based on native norms then it's going to be very hard to change what the high school teachers do right Jim just one one little question so the f they have to take English to enter the university and also after they they finish the the, the their courses, or just to enter? Uh, most departments still require a year of English at the university also. Uh, so the economics department, things like that, they still require, I think, at least one year of English. But for them for them to enter the university, do they yeah, take they have, an English, they they take take an English, English. test? Yes, they do. Yeah. Uh-huh. You can take uh, up to three or four. You could take English, math, uh, Japanese language. Uh -huh you know, something like uh, biology or something like that. You, sometimes you can take three or four subjects, but English is always one of them. One of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think this is, in terms of questions, I think we're fine, right, Daniel? All right. So uh, it's, I think we, we, I think it's time to, to say goodbye because it's almost midnight in Japan. So then, we don't want to tire you out, James, but uh, thank you very oh, much okay. once again for this wonderful uh, the talk, interaction, lots of interesting insights. And of course, uh, anytime you want to, you know, to see us again, uh, you know, especially at this moment online. Yeah. So please free, feel free to do that. But it was great yeah. having you with us. Yeah. So I'm sure that... Uh, now we know a little bit more about, uh, you know, ELF in Japan. And the, the idea is exactly this, too. The more we expand our horizons, the better. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, it was really a great pleasure to see you and to have this great conversation with you. And thank you, everybody, uh, who, you know, who came to see us. Okay, James, is just now I usually ask uh, our guests to, you know, give the final words. And then we also have a, a final picture bef after okay. Daniel, uh, you know, stops uh, broadcasting. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here and uh, to see my, my, I first met Savio in, uh, I think, Istanbul, where yeah. he, I was presenting with my Indian colleague. Anamika and you stayed later after the session and so we've stayed I don't I'm not sure what year that was now El that was 2013 oh so it seems longer than eight years so yeah that's the Brazil experience right you, you get friendly with yeah, people yeah yeah like 20 but thank you and thank you for helping to push this along because uh um it was a nice discussion based theme and so I I didn't want to have to go through the whole paper uh, no, so yeah, you, you sure, sure. The, the crucial things. And thank you, Daniel, for also for uh, moderating and for your uh, 
good question. His question got me a little uh, yeah. off base because I, I had the first two steps of it. I, my, I can only do a logical <laughs> chain of three steps. And then when he went to the fourth and fifth step, I lost the first and second chains. So, uh, thank you. Guys. No, you know, it's good fun. because we, we know that you are a reference for us in Japan. And also by reading your paper, we can see uh, lots of colleagues and important yes, uh, elf yes. scholars uh, doing great yes. work in Japan. So this is yeah. really, really, uh, you know, that's that's what this whole, you know, research group is about. Mm -hmm. We do we do our work here in Brazil, but we want to be uh, connected with all as as many colleagues as possible, you know, around the world for us to exchange ideas, uh, you know, research results. So this is really, really important for us. And the Let references me know if, stuff, if I can uh, introduce thanks, thanks to Jay. those people, you know. I have references from Japan. I like so an introduction to this now. The what, Daniel? I have uh, sound references well. from Japan to use in my thesis oh. now. Thanks yes, James. exactly. James, Sorry, we're yeah, my sound went to zero. Now it's back. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. Good, night. good night, everyone, then, or good morning. Good, happy lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and you too. So, Daniel, when you stop, we can, you know, just take the take picture, picture, right? Uh, okay, I'm going to stop now. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Is this, this is it for the picture, just.